Okay, so we're just gonna head into our final session for tonight. Um, so <clears throat> we're gonna be talking with two farmers markets on their experience planning farmers market events. Um, this is a topic that I hear a lot about when I go to farmers markets all across the state. And what a better way to learn the ins and outs of these kinds of events than from farmers market peers. So really excited. First up, we have Joshua England of the Lexington Farmers Market. Josh has been with the farmer's market for over 10 years and has been the market manager for nearly nine years now. He is a fierce advocate for the year round market and the 50 plus farmers that set up each week during peak season. Josh has worked to invigorate the already bustling market with fun events aimed at bringing in new customers all throughout the season. Josh, we're really excited to hear about the market, how you think of these events, and some things that you've learned along the way, because I'm sure in nine years you have some uh, tips and tricks and uh, have learned a few things that definitely don't work. So whenever you are ready, we will just spotlight you and you can share your screen. Awesome. So there's a lot of ideas that we can share in the chat there. Um, so I'm not going to talk about too much specifics because sometimes um, talking about a specific event can get overwhelming. So I'm going to help relay some things that we do at the farmer's market that helps us create a framework in order to execute hundreds of events each year. I know that that sounds like a, a lot, but every time we have a farmer's market in my head, I'm thinking that that is an event. People are coming there and they want to have a certain experience. And then on top of that, we have um, sub events at all of our things. So um, Bethany, can you go to the next slide real quick? Yeah, um, so I want to divide some of these into categories because um, like we've talked about and like you've heard, um, event could be all over the place. It could be everything from uh, a huge signature event like the Cold Brew Coffee Festival that I'll talk about shortly to a weekly event like um, a pop kids club or an author event like I will talk about or even um, a special event where you have a community partner. Um, and I'll show you an example of that where we partnered with UK Healthcare for the Be Healthy Bash. But then farmers markets and farms and other direct sales um, people are asked to go out into the community sometimes. Um, and so those are also events that you have to think through. Um, so they might be a pop up where you're going to a different place to sell your items. What do you want your booth to look like there? Is it the same kinds of things that you need for um, if you are being at a farmer's market or if you're doing a, um, a, a farm stand? What kinds of equipment do you need? Um, and then uh, tastings, you might go into a classroom uh, and have a, a bring your farmer to school day. Um, I know that Sharon has talked about um, some of the events that they've done in Frankfurt um, with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture that have been really successful. Um, and when we had the blueberry growers co uh, group, they often did that. And so all of those are events. They're things you have to think through and plan um, to make sure that they are executed um, well. So let's go to the next one. Um, so. How many of you have ever been overwhelmed by planning an event? Just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I like a lot of um, interaction, so I am not the best at a slideshow, but I see some thumbs going up, some thumbs. Yes, there we go. Good. Um, so when you're thinking about uh, a, uh, a an event, you want to think of uh, a return on investment. We're always thinking about that. How much time and energy am I going to have to invest to get the outcome that I hope. Um, and so if it's a customer engagement event, that return on investment is different than maybe a holiday party return on investment. Or if you are trying to raise money with a farm to table dinner, you literally have a return on investment that you're trying to recoup. So each one of those goals are something that you need to consider and prioritize. Maybe um, a customer engagement event um, can be as simple as having coffee for um, the people that are attending your farmer's market for free for a day. Uh, and that requires very little um, at site pre-planning or anything like that. Or it could be as complicated as throwing a giant um, Christmas dinner for the local um, uh, homeless shelter. So all of those in between, um, you have to think about how much time, how much commitment, how much money am I going to have um, at my disposal to make sure this event it, um, is executed? And then how much um, do I want in return? Do I need to recoup all the money? Am I using this as a marketing expense? Am I using this as just a way to build audience? Um, do I need to have an immediate or an acute return on investment? Do I need something in my hand at the end of the day? Or can it be 
um, cumulative. And I look at how much money and how much engagement, and how much community presence I'm building over the course of months or years. Um, and so those are things that you need to think about uh, before you start planning a single event or a regular series. Um, and then workflow. So what is the timeline? Bigger events take bigger timelines. Um, how much staffing or volunteers do you need? Um, once again, how many of you have extra time if you've ever worked at a farmer's market to spend four hours doing something other than the normal farmer's market things during farmer's market time? Anyone? I think there's silence. No one has extra time um, on Saturday mornings or, or Tuesday afternoons to, to devote six hours um, very often. Um, and so uh, I, I see that some people focus on social media, and that's an important thing, um, and that you might have extra time to be able to uh, focus on having an event in, in that case. Uh, but it, a lot of our farmers um, who only have one employee that go to the market might not have time to even volunteer on a special day. And then budget. So how much money are you hoping to spend on the, the event? And then how much money do you need to... Uh, earn or bring in because of that event. Um, and then most important, who are your partner organizations? Because there are other people who probably can do the thing that you want to do um, better in many cases uh, with the, the event. And so just outsource if you can. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our homegrown authors. So this is a summer a weekly um, event. I call it an event. It's a series that we host at the Lexington Farmers Market on Saturdays and Sundays, in which we partner with the Carnegie Center um, for Literacy and Learning in Lexington and the Kentucky Humanities Council, um, and they help schedule authors that are from Kentucky to come to the farmers market. I um, mean, they get to sell their books, but they also get to engage with the community. Um, and so one of the reasons why we like this program is it helps us reach a different audience, but it also increases what I call stickiness. Um, it's the amount of time that any individual will stay at the farmer's market. And so um, I don't want people just to rush in and rush out. And if there are more people to be engaged and engaging things, then they're likely to stick around for an extra five minutes. And maybe in that five minutes, they decide, uh, maybe I do want um, a smoothie or yeah, I do I uh, think I'm going to buy an extra watermelon for this weekend. And so this takes a lot of planning because every weekend we have three authors, two on Saturday and one on Sunday. Um, and I don't have the capacity to be able to schedule all of those people, nor do I know that many authors personally. Um, so that is why for this um, event, um, we partner with those two organizations, like I said. Um, but uh, in the past, we've partnered with a local bookstore, um, and we've even partnered with the library to bring authors um, across various genres to the market to um, engage people and have a good event that cost us very little money. We have to buy a tablecloth and have an extra table for them, but they bring all their other supplies. Um, and so that's a recurring event every week that has a lot of um, community support. It helps people stick around. And uh, we occasionally on days like um, our kids focused author day, we get uh, uh, puppets and coloring. So that's an additional thing to add on. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so then um, we had a special event. So this is something that might take a little bit more planning. Um, and you only want to have one or two of these or three of these uh, um, a, a season. Um, and so uh, this was a partnership with the UK Healthcare. They brought in all kinds of fun activities, games, and health components, as well as extension. And it happened adjacent to um, our Sunday Farmers Market at uh, Southland Drive in down, uh, near downtown Lexington. Uh, and they were able to do things like flu shots and um, do carotenoid readings and talk about uh, cooking demos and those sorts of things, as well as having fun events like the kids obstacle course. With this, this um, took over a month of planning in advance. And um, we had to think about a, a large budget. I um, mean, UK actually did the, yeah, the veggie meter. Yes, we had the veggie meter. Yep. Um, and UK did the majority of the um, heavy lifting with doing all the planning and they had um, the budget. And so we were able to partner with them 
um, use a little bit of our staff resources, just about um, four or five hours total um, leading up to the event to do planning and outreach and communications. Um, and then we were able to, because we partner with UK Healthcare, get this really great um, complimentary event to our Sunday market that helped bring in people help people um, stick around longer. They had that stickiness. Um, and then because of the fundraising and the, the grants that UK had, we were also able to add a special currency for this day. So if you went through three of the different health um, booths, you were able to get um, five bucks to spend at the market. Um, and so I like really when you can pair something up and get money that goes right into the pockets of the farmers. And so even if it does take time, out of the staff's planning, then you have um, a great way to, to um, say it was worth it because you got an extra $50 that day. Um, in that case, UK had funds for those. Um, we still track um, tracked those like we would with our double dollars or our um, uh, kids pop dollars. So we have that infrastructure already built in. Um, but luckily in this case, they were able to um, buy, I believe it was, um, $2,000 worth of vouchers to give to the community as they came through. Um, and so that's a lot of money. Not every event has to be that big, but this was one of our special events. And so we really wanted to make sure that um, we had people, it attracted people and they got something other. And now let's go to our next slide, which is our signature event with the Lexington Farmers Market. And it's our cold brew coffee festival. So cold brew coffee is a uh, coffee that is made um, by lots of uh, coffee shops. Um, they take the beans um, from the coffee and they soak them instead of brew them with hot water. And it creates a much smoother uh, drink than if you were to use hot water. Um, some people can taste the difference, some people can't, but that's really not the focus here. What the focus was is that um, we had a problem and that was the week after Fayette County School started back was also the week that UK had their move in. And um, it really was hard to get parents to come out to the farmer's market because they were overwhelmed with all of the, the, the back to school things. And um, we didn't have very many UK staff and um, customers uh, and students because they were all helping with moving. So we needed an event to bring people, to attract people to the market that um, would that would be really uh, help us fill that need where we were missing so many additional people that typically would come to the market. So we launched this with our coffee vendor um, in 2018, and we invited four other community coffee shops to come in and um, make coffee, sell coffee, uh, and they sold coffee using um, special tokens, um, special little slips like you would at a beer fest. Um, and so the market made money off of that, the vendors for coffee made money off of that, and it brought in a, that first year about 800 extra people. Um, go to the next slide. In 2019, the next year, we were able to um, pretty much double that event. Um, and so uh, it took more planning because there was um, uh, 14 vendors just selling coffee, cold brew coffee, uh, and it brought in about an extra 2,000 people that day. Um, so that, that was really great. Um, the farmers were very busy because just because the people came, the additional people came for the festival, they stuck around for um, all the other stuff that a farmer's market has to offer. And then go to the next slide. And then last year, um, we had over 20 coffee vendors and probably about 6,000 additional customers, which is a huge amount of people that came through. Um, some of those were participating in the festival, some weren't, um, and uh, it drew this giant crowd. Um, almost all of our farmers sold out of product in addition to all of the coffee vendors selling out of product that day. Um, but events like this, that first year when we were just trying to get a couple hundred extra people, that took about four to six weeks of planning. The 2019 year, we spent about two months planning. Um, for 2022, we spent about five months planning. Um, and then for the this year, upcoming 2023, we've already started planning. So nine months, 10 months, 11 months in advance, we're already planning for this event because it has grown so large 
that we have to bring in additional staff and additional people to make sure it, it um, turns out. I mean, I know I'm almost out of time. I might have even gone over, but one more slide, I think. Um, I want you to take away is if you if it can't be planned in advance or outsourced, then consider alternatives because a lot of us don't have extra time um, during our already busy schedules. So if you are going to be doing a special event or a signature event, um, it has to have a really good return on investment. You have to think through um, things and, and try to make sure that you won't overwork yourself or burn out yourself because many of us don't have that extra six hours during a market for a small return of that investment. We need it to be a really good return on investment. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing really quick. I know I have a few questions. Um, I've been to the Lexington Farm, I've worked at the Lexington Farmer's Market, I've been to the Lexington Farmer's Market, um, and I've been to some of the events and you all are really, just do a great job with the organization. Um, do you run into any issues with labor? Yeah, I would say um, that is something that we've struggled with over and over again, is making sure that we have enough staff and volunteers to ensure that the event is running smoothly, that people are enjoying themselves at the event, and that there's someone to clean up. Um, that's often another thing that um, is really hard and you have to think through. Um, so I... I think that labor is a very important thing to consider. The Lexington Farmers Market, we're lucky to have so many seasonal staff members that the core of the events can be run by staff, um, which gives a, um, a little bit of ensured communication and stability in those programs. Um, but uh, that is, I know, not available everywhere, that everywhere usually struggles to make sure that they have staff. Um, and so, that is something that you have to think through. I see a question about volunteers. That's one of the reasons why I think partnering with organizations is so important because um, the Carnegie Center, like I said, uh, they send out a volunteer sometimes at the beginning of the summer. And so I don't even have to worry about that person. They're just there and engaging. Um, and so the more people you can partner with, uh, the better it is and the less you have to be specifically um, focused on. Um, a quick question before we get to the one that's in the chat. Um, do you ever need or have you encountered a need for special permits for these events or um, and or do you have a hard time working with the city? Um, because you all are, are for, I think, is it three out of five of your markets are located downtown? Yeah. Um, and then the other two are in neighborhoods or residential-esque areas. So do you ever have issues working with the city or um, things like that? Obviously. Yeah, I think Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, figuring out bureaucracy, whether that's um, your local school that you may be setting up in the parking lot for or your city, or um, if you set up an extension, everyone has their own little um, requirements. Uh, and so there's sometimes that for small events, it might be, um, I, I can't say this exactly, but um, I have asked for forgiveness for smaller events. Um, that doesn't always work for the larger signature events. We have to work with our health department to make sure that um, for that, since there's additional food vendors that they're following through. Um, and this year we'll also be working with um, the city in order to close down additional space that we typically don't have. Um, and so uh, whenever you're thinking about an event, um, if it's louder than normal, if it's bigger than normal, or if there are more food vendors than normal, you might have to consider additional permitting um, in those cases. Because the worst thing that can happen, a, a terrible thing that can happen is that you um, have a, an extra food truck there and the health department comes and that food truck is not permitted properly and they close down the entire event. That doesn't always happen, but that has happened at events in Lexington before. And so you have to be really careful. Is it worth that risk? Um, sometimes it might be, but I would definitely advise against that. And 6,000 extra customers is not um, the number that you apologize for. 6,000 is the one that you definitely cover all of your bases as much yes. as you can. Um, really quickly, about how many people do you think you have come through on a typical Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, in the summer, um, we typically have at our Saturday market um, somewhere between five and 8,000 people on a regular Saturday. Um, and then on Sunday, it's um, 
during the summer is a, about four to 6,000 people on a typical Sunday. Um, and so for the Cold Brew Coffee Festival that weekend, we had closer to, um, I wanna say 13 or 14,000 people come through our market, um, which is just ridiculous. It's, it's, <laughs> it's bonkers and mind blowing to me, especially considering that it was just supposed to be a way to deal with um, having people not want to get out of bed early after school started. <laughs> Exactly. But when it works, it works. So I imagine that you probably had a lot of cold brew that day and then took a really big nap afterwards because um, that is a lot. And especially if you guys are planning nine and 10 months ahead for this year's, um, it's probably going to be such a relief when that is over with as much as you enjoy them. I'm sure it's a big yeah, um, relief. You do have to, um, the first year I tried every single product. Um, <sighs> because there was only six vendors selling things. Um, last year, I would have literally died had I tried all of the products. Um, so that is something you have to be aware of. You would have needed paramedics on site for sure. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. and then um, just two more quick questions. Um, so have you seen any success with individual booths doing individual like micro events, which I haven't heard of. I don't know if um, you've experienced that. Yeah, um, what I find best for those sorts of things um, is uh, if a micro event is great. So, for example, um, one of our vendors ha has often done little like mushroom coloring pages. So they'll have a special event where they try to get kids to, to color a picture of a mushroom because they sell mushrooms. Um, that's great. But what I found works even better is if you can get two or three vendors to have a similar Thing. So even if the market doesn't have the capacity to do a special event, if you can get three vendors to have a scavenger hunt or three vendors to do a coloring page or three vendors to, to each hand out stickers, um, then that micro event does help bring even more people. There's a synergy there. I hate using that word. That sounds so corporate, but it does <laughs> seem to work a little bit better than just one offs. Okay. And then the final question. Um, especially for markets that are not in central Kentucky, how do you find organizations to partner with? Is that kind of like a cold email? Is that just uh, connecting with like Chamber of Commerce? What would you recommend for that? Yeah, so this is a little bit more complicated. And so I will explain this um, briefly, but uh, a lot of boards of farmers markets um, question and wonder, why do um, the staff go to things like the community health advisory boards? Or why do staff go to the weekly or bi-weekly um, extension meetings? Um, and that is one of the best reasons why I justify those is that I meet all of my partners at these community events. Um, and so in the past, we've had um, an event called Lex Walk, where customers came to the market um, and they did a short um, walking loop. Uh, and that was funded and volunteered and planned by um, someone that we, with a small committee of people that I met at a um, health community, a community health assessment meeting, um, where they all really wanted to do some kind of unique event. Um, so it, it can be hard, but the resources that I always refer people to is um, your uh, extension agent, if you get along with your extension agent, um, then I would say the family outreach coordinators at your local schools have a lot of great partner resources. Um, hospitals are a great resource. Um, your local library is a huge resource. Um, it, it, even if they can't partner with you, they often know who can. Um, and then there's typically someone in the city government, maybe it's in Parks and Recreation, um, even that has contacts for people that sponsor the baseball field or the parade. And you can go to them and say, hey, do you know of any of these that might be willing to help us with uh, a health event on a certain day? Well, thank you so much, Josh. Um, if anyone has any further questions, I can be sure to reach out to him or they can contact you at info at lexingtonfarmersmarket.com. Um, and be sure if you are ever in the Central Kentucky area on a Saturday or Sunday or during the peak season, we're about to head into the uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday market. You can make sure that you can hit them up. <laughs> My mom asked me, when does the Sunday market start? It starts April 2nd. And I almost cried because I looked down at my watch and I said, that's. That's two weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So. Um, but the Saturday market is all year round. Um, and so 
just keep an eye out for any of those special events. Um, and I'm sure if you run into Josh, you can pick his brain and ask even more questions. But this was such a great overview um, and just a really great example in Central Kentucky. So thank you so much, Josh. Thank you. And then we're going to hop on over to Owensboro. Let me pull up. OK, so next we have Merritt Bates Thomas of the Owensboro Regional Farmers Market. She was a board member for six years, a current market volunteer, and has been involved with the market since 2004. Merritt has been part of many of the farmers markets past events, including the recurring night markets, taste of the market events, and themed Halloween markets. Gearing up to open for the season on April 15th, Merritt, we're excited to hear what plans you all have for 2023. So if you want to take it away, it is all for you. Thank you so much, Bethany. And I just want to start off by saying uh, everything Amanda and Josh have said. I don't know that I can top the information they've shared because it's been so informative and especially listening to Amanda, so much of what she shared has been some of the marketing guidance that we've tried to follow. And so I can say if we're a test market, everything she shared, uh, a lot of what she shared has actually worked for us as well. So uh, hats off to Amanda. I'm going to share a screen because I like to use photos as a backdrop for the story that I share about our market. And I think everyone will be able to tell how much I love the market. Um, and just for fun, I like to visit farmers markets when I'm traveling. So farmers markets just feel like my home away from home. If I had to title this presentation, it would be Owensboro Regional Farmers Market from the ground up or possibly from parking lot to pavilion. Five years ago, we broke ground on what is now the site of our market pavilion. You'll see that shortly. And this is our then group of board members, some um, extension staff, and some of the ag development staff from KDA and local partners that were instrumental in helping us make this dream a reality. But what you see too in the backdrop, if you see that ear of corn, uh, we're building for our future, help us reach our goal. I think really one of the game changers for us was writing for and successfully receiving a community engagement grant from the Kentucky Department for Public Health. And just the seeds that planted for us as we were preparing, thinking ahead and hoping to be building our market pavilion in the near future, thinking about things that we could do to creatively engage our customers, engage the community and engage business partners in making that pavilion a reality and making the market a community destination when we were open. Uh, the neat thing about, it was just a bit of creative genius as we brainstormed, you know how so many times when they're fundraisers, they have uh, thermometer gauges or something of that nature so that you can measure progress. Well, since it was a farmer's market, we decided to make it bicolor corn. And we filled in, we had a local artist, we commissioned her with some of our grant money, paint it for us. And then she gave us the leftover paint so that as we neared our goal, we could fill in the kernels of corn and show the progress we were making. And you can see on groundbreaking day, we had pretty much closed in on the goal. Really all that's left at the top are some unfilled uh, little kernels of corn. So you fast forward and this is what our market pavilion looked like when it was completed. We did not have the barn quilts yet on the front, but they are there now. Uh, to the right, you have the beekeeper and to the left, you have what I've named vegetable garden. And they pay homage to some of our previous vendors who are no longer with us but who really began the dream of having a permanent market site. 
And so every time I look at those, I think of their dream and their vision for the market and uh, realize really they're still with us in spirit. And the other thing that we did is we, we moved into our new pavilion was we launched a new market brand with our Owensboro Regional Farmers Market logo that is there on the front of the pavilion. And next picture. It wasn't there originally, but additionally, we used some grant funding to finish off the back. This uh, fronts one of the main streets. This is the back of our pavilion, but it's what many people see as they drive past the market on Parish Avenue, or they would see as they're headed south on Triplet Street. We're at the corner of a major intersection in the heart of Owensboro. And so we proudly display the Kentucky Proud logo, a portion of our, our logo to the left, and then the main naming of, of the pavilion so that people know it is our local farmer's market. Another thing we were able to do, well, let me back up here too. I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. So as we pause here, because this was actually taken last year, it was one of the most beautiful market days we had mid-June. The weather was perfect. And the other thing you can see, uh, we learned during the pandemic, much as we wanted a, a sheltered home for our vendors, as soon as we moved in, we had customers telling us we were too crowded. Uh, much as they wanted to be undercover, the customers and the vendors, we did learn that there was very little elbow room on a really crowded day. So we had the opportunity once markets opened back up during 2020, uh, a market volunteer actually did a survey asking customers what they liked about the market, what they would improve. Many of the customers commented they liked the open feel of the market. They liked the pavilion, they liked the open feel. And you can get a glimpse of what we've compromised on here. We have vendors that are under the pavilion, but we have vendors that still like to be under their pavilions with their pickup trucks or their vans backed up to that canopy and servicing then their table and keeping it stocked for customers. So we have the best of both worlds. Our customers are happy. The food trucks are interspersed along the Parish Avenue side or this side that you are facing. And it's really the best of both worlds where people can congregate under the pavilion. We have a few picnic tables where people can sit and eat a snack or eat a breakfast, sip some coffee or sip from one of our local uh, cold pressed juice vendors and really enjoy that community feel that we want them to experience when they're here. The other thing our community engagement grant did for us was it gave us the idea of working with various theme days. And a couple of the popular ones that we launched in 2017 were our Jam Fest, where we invited customers to bring homemade jam to be judged, sampled and judged, by celebrity judges, and we also had a salsa day. And you think back about how just simply inviting celebrities to an event changes the whole trajectory of your market and opens up different avenues to you to be able to market your market uh, to a completely different audience. Uh, one of the celebrity pairs we invited was a local uh, TV show host, midday TV show host, and a popular local meteorologist. And the other was uh, a morning show pair on one of our local country music stations. Uh, what we got on the, the radio station was free publicity. You know, periodically, depending on what I'm doing at the time, we were advertising some with them, what was, which was bringing customers into the market, but they are two of the biggest promoters of our local market. 
the other thing that happened with the TV show was then that very next season, the year we opened the pavilion, we had an invite to appear on the show and talk about the opening of the market and the different activities and events. And ever since then, with the exception of maybe the 2020 season when it was delayed a bit because the market opened later, everything has grown from there. They came back the following year to judge Salsa Day. Uh, it's been some great publicity for us. And this year, we're actually looking at them being one of the market sponsors with an actual market day, which will bring more customers to the market as well. But it becomes a win-win because then the trade-off is we get more spots on air to promote different activities at the market. In 2019, we launched our first evening market series. And along with that came some special activities in, um, I believe that was the year we launched also just a limited release of our chef at the market where we invited local chefs to prepare samples of items uh, using market ingredients that were that they uh, purchased from our local vendors. Of course, everyone knows we skipped 2020. We were back in 2021 on a limited basis. And then 2022 was a much bigger year. We've worked to pair the Chef at the Market series with music. Music has always played an integral part in our market. Owensboro is the bluegrass capital. Uh, so we like to not only enjoy our bluegrass, our country music, we've had some great local talent come through the market that's moved on to some bigger things as well. And we're always looking for that next big act too that can make their big breakthrough or one of their big breakthroughs at the market. Three years ago, we launched, uh, I think coming out of the pandemic, everybody was looking for something different to do. And being outside was such a popular activity and it was one of the safer things that people could do. One of our market volunteers and our then market manager, or actually I think it was two of a market vendor and a market volunteer, had the idea to have a holiday market to cap off the market year, where we invited craft vendors, a variety of vendors, any of our farmer vendors or regular market vendors who had product to still sell uh, to be part of that holiday market. And it's proved to be a success. Our third annual market held this past November, it's the first Saturday in November, was a windy experience. That was the day now one of our infamous windstorms decided to blow through. Uh, we got two hours out of the market that day and then we lost power. So at least two hours of a good holiday market. Uh, Bethany also mentioned about three years ago too was when we launched the Halloween costume contest. And we do a parade of costumes. We have three different categories. Uh, we have the children's, we have the adults, and then we have the group or family. And that's proved to be uh, an event that has grown year after year. Uh, I mentioned sponsors. Um, some of our initial sponsors were actually donating uh, in terms of the monies used to actually help us build the market. We completed that five-year sponsorship, and now we're in the process of launching yet another five years, uh, looking at reconnecting with some of our, uh, our uh, initial vendor or sponsors, and then also reaching out to new possible sponsors as well to be part of that market atmosphere. Uh, we promote them, and they in turn come and bring exciting activities to the market, one of our groundbreaking, I think, uh, events, one of our signature events is our art, food, and health event held annually and sponsored by our local health system, Owensboro Health. And they bring various musical talent from all different genres. They bring different artists and make it a true hands-on experience so that the community can walk through 
They can observe people making pottery. They can observe people painting. Uh, they have craft tables. And like I said, they can listen to a variety of different musical genres, everything from our local symphony to bluegrass musicians and then everything in between. Um, I think one of the key things that Amanda said rings true and whether one of our market volunteers is doing our Facebook Live weekly video on Saturday mornings uh, or whether it's just our, our marketing volunteer taking pictures that we can post on Facebook as early in the market day as possible. Uh, it's so important that you really capture the authentic atmosphere of the market. Everything from a vendor just being who they are to pictures of produce the way they're typically displayed or one of our most popular items. Let me see here. If, uh, this was, um, it's our Little Miss Piggy. It was donated for $5,000. It was created, but a $5,000 donation to the market. Uh, we had a series of pigs that were painted and donated to various nonprofits. And Piggy was donated to us by Owensboro Health. She is the star of the show. She sits outside the concession stand window at our main entrance, and I get the honor of seeing the joy she brings to many of our market patrons on a weekly basis. She's where people want their, their photographs taken. She is where children gravitate to. Miss Piggy needs a saddle for all the children that grab her by the ears and jump up on her back. She's very good natured. Uh, she's weathered at least four years. I believe she's not quite as old as the pavilion, uh, but she's done it with a smile on her face. She's done it graciously and she looks as good as new. And uh, I think finding your stride, really finding whatever fits with your community, be true to who your community is and they will love you back and they appreciate that. Uh, creating events and attractions that speak to the wants of your community, the interest of your community. And it doesn't hurt if you try something that doesn't necessarily go that well or doesn't really seem to generate that much enthusiasm. Knowing that you tried it and learning from the experience it is part of, of finding who you truly are as a market and really playing to the strengths of that market. Because if you don't try new things and learn from those experiences, you really don't grow. I know we tried really hard the first couple of years of the pavilion to have theme days almost every week. It was a lot of work. And in fact, we had a couple of board members say to me, do we really need to be theming every week? And I said, but it's so much fun. And they looked at me and they said, is it really? <laughs> For all the work that you put into it, I think it still, it brings a fun atmosphere. And even for the few who would participate, whether it was Derby Day or whatever it might be, um, it still brings a hint of celebration and enthusiasm to the market and the patrons seem to enjoy that as well. And then one last picture, something we tried to do at the holiday market and for Halloween, we create a photo backdrop. And I don't have pictures of those, but one of the permanent pieces that we have created on our storage building. It was just a plain gray and white storage building with a nice roof that sat at the back part of our property along Parish Avenue. And I think last year the board decided that if the public was going to see it, one of the vendor's daughters uh, offered to paint it for us and donate the paint and her time. And she decided to paint sunflowers on both sides and that's a photo backdrop where people can go if they want a picture at the market and uh, just 
brings us a pop of color. It looks nice sitting along the street and it's a colorful addition to the market in addition to some of the temporary photo props we bring in from time to time. And Bethany, that is all I have. I'm getting ready to pop my um, my email address as soon as I can take my screen share off. I'm going to pop my email address into the chat. So for anyone who has questions, if I can't get an answer, I will work to get the answer for the group. Thank you so much. Um, that's so great to have those kinds of like agritourism, um, just the, the picture opportunities too, just um, when people post those that it's recognizable and that um, it just really motivates people to take as many pictures at your market as they can. So I love that. Um, I do have a few questions and if anyone else wants to add some to the chat, please go for that. Um, but one of the events that you all did in 2022 was a back to school day. And I think that's such a great idea. What brought about that and how, like what kind of um, different things did you do for that event? One of our primary sponsors, Independence Bank, sponsors, uh, of course, Independence Bank. You always think of 4th of July and uh, 1776. Uh, so they sponsor uh, two days. One is their Revolutionary Day in um, July, right around the 4th, and then the Back to School Day, because they're committed to uh, getting kids back to school successfully and giving them tools they need to be successful in the classroom. They always bring a craft event that can engage the children and set them on the stage to learning or keeping them engaged in, in some sort of, of activity. Like during the summer, I think uh, back this past July, they did an event that became a mural at the main branch, the home branch that just spoke to community and how we were each other's neighbor and everybody could paint their individual piece and it they went into one big mosaic it was beautiful and i need to see if they kept a picture of that because it would be a great part of a presentation like this but each of the sponsors picks their theme day and independence bank was committed to wanting to do that back to school day and have that craft activity their employees love coming out being part of the celebration and interacting with the community as well i love that that sounds really beautiful and i love that they all get to play on their own day that sounds like that's very fun i like that um, and Sharon Spencer in the group message talked about how Independence Bank, Bank is great to work with and very ag friendly. She's had several counties that they are always first to step up um, and set up at. So it's really great to hear. Um, we did have a question if you wouldn't mind to talk a little bit more about the cooking demos that you all do with the different chefs, just how that works and a little bit more detail about that. The challenge for us initially, it's great to have a chef at your market. Uh, the challenge is Saturday mornings are so crowded, and that's usually when chefs have some time off or they're shopping at the market for that night, uh, as a couple of ours do. And it's great to have them as customers like that. Thursday evenings, they're in their kitchens at the restaurants. So we've actually had to work to engage those that don't have restaurants. We've gone a bit outside of the community, but still within the radius, usually within about 50 miles, so that it's still local talent of sorts. But they get to prepare items using, we give them a budget. Our local diabetes coalition has sponsored uh, the chef at the market for the last two seasons, helping to buy the fresh local produce because it's market focused, and then give the chefs a stipend for their time as well. And uh, we had a sponsor, one of our appliance centers that sells big green eggs. 
They provided a big green egg where the chefs could grill and it smells wonderful. Um, we've had vendors that have provided the cooktop for us, depending on what was being prepared. And uh, just basically reaching out to, if you find a great partner in a chef with talent and with the willingness to come be part of the market, we don't let them go. We invite them back year after year. And in fact, we're about halfway through planning, uh, but I actually have people approach me now wanting to be part of the Chef at the Market series. So we're looking forward to some new and different things in 2023. That's so nice to not have to be the person that has to reach out to them, that you're starting to get to where they'll reach out to you because that saves you quite a bit of time and stress and just extra planning if they just already come to you. And I don't know if you find that with musicians as well, um, because I've, every I've seen some. Every connection you make matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a few of those key connections, I highlight that community engagement grant, just the great presentations we heard that day and the seeds that were planted to give us ideas to reach out. You know, I think we're always afraid to hear the word no. And a really important person in my life taught me, if you don't ask, the answer always is no. And so what if you hear no? Then there's somebody out there that will say yes. And I maintain that's always where you're supposed to land. We're not always going to hear yes. But uh, when you do, when things align and you connect with the right people, good things happen from there. And the visibility that those TV appearances and the radio spots have given us, they bring new people into the market all the time. Just being brave enough to ask the question, ask folks to be part of your story, really does begin to open some doors. I love that. And that's such a positive outlook on all of it, too. It's You're exactly right. If you don't ask, you'll never know. And the worst that could happen is just someone says no. So. Um, you can always just keep on persevering. Um, and then just one final question. So roughly um, how much foot traffic do you have on a typical Saturday? Um, and then compared to that, what does it look like for a special event like the night markets? Well, here's what we say about the night markets. The night markets are busier than the Thursday market. Thursday morning market would have been. And that's our comparison there. Uh, making the decision to go to the Thursday night market was not an easy one. And it was honestly met with some resistance because our typical market days uh, during the three main summer months, June, July, and August, are they had been Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, Saturday morning. So there's spacing and time in between for the farmers to be in the field, picking produce. The challenge is um, between Thursday night and Saturday morning, there's less time <laughs> to get your product, your produce out of the field. And basically, even in the heat of summer, maybe even to recover, because those afternoon markets are definitely hotter. So our foot traffic on a good Thursday night in Owensboro, Kentucky, I'm thinking best of the best might be 200 to 250. Uh, you compare that to maybe what would have been 60 to 70 on a Thursday morning. So that's become kind of a, a no brainer. If you, it's going to be worth your time to actually get out and bring produce or, or your product to the market. Um, our morning markets are double digit. Typically, they're not triple digit. Rarely would they be unless it is July 4th. And we always are open if July 4th falls on um, a Tuesday and typically if it had been on a Thursday morning. I don't know that we've ever had to cross the bridge of it being a Thursday. We'd probably shift that market to a Thursday morning if we, we needed to. Typical foot traffic on a busy Saturday would probably be about 12 to 1500. 
And uh, it starts off slowly, but each year we've seen the foot traffic increase. So it's really hard other than seeing, wow, that's a really good day. My gauge as a, a volunteer in our concession stand is, uh, we had our best ever concession stand sales last year, and that's driven by foot traffic. I think the other key thing too, you'll hear vendors maybe comment if they see more of products like theirs being sold. In particular, maybe baked goods or other value added items like soaps or jewelry, things we know that bring additional traffic to the market or even additional beverages or coffee stands. Bottom line, typically what I've seen they typically don't suffer. Uh, more means they're attracted to more and sales improve for everyone because there are more choices and people feel as though there is something there for them. So at this point, the growth has been an absolutely good thing for everyone. That's great. Questions around the foot traffic. Now for a market, I cannot honestly remember our holiday market, but I believe it probably drives us up a little bit more, like maybe closer to the 2000, because it's so out of the ordinary. People are in the mood to be out, be shopping, and they're attracted to other things. It's our usual customers plus others. No, that's uh, just hearing the Thursday night or the Thursday morning compared to Thursday night numbers going from roughly 60 or 80 customers coming through to about 200 is a really great increase. So it's great that um, you guys have been able to see that. And, um, and 60 and just, or 80 on a Thursday morning was probably a little generous. Yes. Yeah. No. So that's incredible. And just seeing that those different events really do have an effect on on the foot traffic. Um, so Merritt had put her email in the um, chat and I have saved it and I'll send it out to everyone. So if you have any additional questions for Merritt, for Josh or Amanda, um, you can feel free to either email those over to me or you can contact them um, via their emails themselves. Um, but thank you so much, Merritt. That was a wonderful presentation. And then we're just going to close out for tonight.